Amen. Thank you, choir, and good morning. It is good to see you. I want you to take your Bible. I want you to find Genesis chapter 2 as we keep walking through the book of Genesis together. Glad you are here. If you're a guest of ours today, we're very thankful to see you and have you worshiping with us. I want to ask everybody to grab your worship folder that you received. On the in, in the inside, there's this card called our Connect card. So if you are new, we would love to get acquainted. Would you please consider putting your information on this card? You simply will leave it in your seat on your way out. On the other side, for everybody, uh, we would love to know how we can pray for you. Please consider putting in a prayer request for you or for your family. We appreciate that. I also want to encourage you uh, to look through your worship folder for any information of ministries or events coming up that uh, you might need to know about. I want to mention one in particular. Uh, Next Sunday, our divorce care ministry is beginning their next session. So if you or someone you know is going through separation or has gone through divorce and you would desire some sincere gospel-centered encouragement, I want to encourage you to consider uh, signing up for this. Or if you know someone who might benefit, would you please encourage them to do so? They can simply email info at chapinbaptist.com. It's a 13-week session. It is led by people who have gone through divorce, people who know uh, that pain, but also know that uh, they experience joy through Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you to consider that ministry if you or someone you know needs it. It's a much-needed ministry, and it's also timely in terms of this week and next week, looking at the passages of Scripture where God creates the institution of marriage, and then we so quickly see it get fractured because of sin. So we know that this is a much-needed ministry, and we pray that God would glorify His name through it. I want us to go ahead and pray. Would you bow your head with me, and let's ask God to help us hear what He has to say through His Word. God, please speak now through Scripture. We believe that when we open up the Bible, we are opening up your self-revelation that you have breathed out these words, every one of them. We remind ourselves that we we are very presumptuous to just come to church and almost yawn at the idea of hearing a sermon. So help us to realize who it is we're dealing with. The creator of the universe. The creator of humankind the creator of man and woman. And you're not just our creator, you are our savior, you are our redeemer, you are our sustainer. And we give you praise for being all of those perfectly. And we just humbly beg that you would help us hear from you now. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week I asked you to think about Joshua's perspective. I want to do that again. Just stay in Genesis chapter 2. I want to read to you from the first chapter of Joshua. Joshua is taking Moses' place. Moses has written down the law, the Torah, God's word for his people. Joshua is now taking over, charged to take God's people from the wilderness where they've been wandering for an entire generation into the promised land. God says this to Joshua, Be strong and courageous, for you will cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law 
shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Let's just use our imagination. Let's just imagine Joshua that night going into his tent, lighting a candle, taking seriously this charge he's just received from God himself that he better focus on his word. He better meditate on the word of God and he, in the glow, in the shimmering glow of candlelight, he starts to read through the book of Genesis. The weight of the people of God on his shoulders. I fear that we don't take seriously enough the calling that we have to walk in the promises of God, the one who will fulfill those promises. We need to take just as seriously as Joshua would have that night. Soaking in his word, pondering in his word. Trying to see how God gave us a word to lead us to fulfill our calling. So let's just kind of pull up a spot next to Joshua. And begin in chapter 2, verse 4. God's word says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Let me point out this word generations. Your version may something, say something a little different. You may see the word account or even history, something of that effect. The word generations is a massive, important word of the book of Genesis. Genesis is essentially structured on ten times this word occurs. Generations that that points to something that's just been mentioned, or usually someone, as we'll see. You see in chapter 5, verse 1, we're introduced to the generations of Adam. The generations of something that's been mentioned, and now it carries forward. It's like a hinge word, carrying forward of, or here's how it all went down. So these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Let me just point two other things quickly before we continue. Notice this phrase, the Lord God. We haven't been introduced to God like that yet in, ver in chapter 1. Here we see this word Lord inserted before the name God. It's a hint of intimacy as we'll see later on in the sermon. Another hint of intimacy is the way that now earth and heaven... It's inverted. When first mentioned, it's the heavens and the earth. Then in the second half of the verse, it's the earth and the heavens kind of hinting it now. There's going to be a focus on what's going on in, in the earth. It's a more intimate demonstration of God creating. Verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, just so you know there are hints of things to come. Hints of the fall that we will watch happen next week. Where we see Adam is now cursed, given a cursed ground. Thorns and thistles. Rain is mentioned in verse 5. We know that infamously rain will come to flood the earth. Man is given the ground to work. Verse 6 tells us a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. Now pay attention to this description. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is up close and personal. It's how God creates. The man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. That word seems to have the connotation of paradise with it. In the east, 
There he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. I want you just to imagine this paradise garden. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. We don't know exactly where this river would have been. The name Havilah has a sense of sandy places. You might think of desert or even beaches, especially in the the realm of a paradise. There's gold there. The gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. Some think that may be referring to the area near Ethiopia. Others say it's somewhere on the other side. We don't know for sure. The name of the third river is the Tigris. Now you have names you're familiar with, perhaps, at least from history class, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Note that there's no description of the Euphrates, nothing elaborating about it. Interesting, as we'll see in a few moments. Verse 15 tells us, The Lord God took them and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but... Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now let's stop there. And let's just think about everything God has given the man. He's given him paradise, a garden, that's paradise. He says every tree is pleasant to the sight, so Picture the the most beautiful trees you've seen. There's a river flowing out of Eden, just this majestic picture of paradise. Even mentions this name Havilah, right? The beach where there's gold. God has given the man paradise. He's also given the man provision. The trees that are pleasant to the sight are also good for food. One of them is named the tree of life. Like it, does, it doesn't get more provisional than that. God is giving the man life in this paradise. The gold has been mentioned, bedellium, onyx stone, all of these precious stones. He even tells the man in verse 16, you can eat of every tree of the garden but one. Like abundant provision he's given this man in paradise. On top of paradise provision, he's given the man purpose. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to keep it. The man has a real God-given purpose in paradise. And not only is he given him paradise and provision and purpose, he's given him protection In verse 17, he protects the man, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. He protects him, he lets him know, don't eat of the tree that would give you the knowledge of evil, because you'll die if you do. So he is given right out of the gate, paradise, provision, purpose, and protection, but believe it or not, not everything is good yet. Even with all of that, not everything is good. Look at verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good. Now remember, Genesis 1 kind of carries us all the way through the creation account. It tells us when male and female are made, then it's very good. And now we see in this more zoomed in account, yeah, it's, it's not yet good. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And I want you to know this word for helper, 
It does mean that. Aid, assistant, oh, but it means more than that. It's used in terms of when, when someone needs the kind of help where they need a hero. They need someone who, who can go to battle for them in their behalf. It is often used of God himself. God says, I'm going to make someone like that for the man. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. It's just an interesting moment. Dog. Camel. Muskrat. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. So now, Adam has paradise and provision. He has purpose. He's given protection. And he has power. He has all this authority. When, when someone names something else, they're demonstrating authority, right? God called the light day. He called the waters seas, demonstrating authority over those things that were worshipped as supposed God in their day and age. And now we see man given the authority to name the creatures of creation. Power. But there's still something missing. Everything is not yet good Adam has paradise, provision, purpose, protection, power, but he needs a partner. We're told in the second half of verse 20, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him, not in all the animal kingdom. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last, or we may say finally, enough of looking at yaks and gorillas and goats. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She shall be called Isha, because she was taken from Ish. Therefore, Moses tells us, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, his woman. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, everything is very good. That's when God proclaims. He looks at everything that he's done. As we see in chapter 1, he says, this is all very good. Ladies, I want to tell you something. You complete creation. We don't want just a bunch of dudes In this very real way, you are, it's often said, the crown jewel of creation. It's because of you, it's because of the woman, it's because of the female, that God was finally, at last, able to say, it's all very good. And I just want you to know that we have an enemy we will meet him next Sunday in chapter 3. We have an enemy, and he wants to take your feminine beauty that God has created in you. Your enemy is going to want to exploit it or try to erase it. We want to go to war against that. God's word teaches God has made you as the crown jewel of creation. 
Adam was able to say, at last, finally, he saw this, this creature it looks so much like him, but so much better. Amen, gentlemen? I want you to think about this woman that was created. The Bible refers to her as his wife. Adam's wife came from the very same dust. Think about this. Not, not the dust next to the pile that God took for Adam. God took a pile Made Adam out of it? No, he didn't, he didn't scoop up another pile. No. He made the wife from the same dust. He just took some from Adam. That's how intimate this part of creation is. The wife came from his side. Like she, she fit really well next to him. She came from a rib. You got to think, it's like, that's sort of a cage, right? The cage of his heart. She, she cracked open the cage of his heart, so to speak. That's how intentional God is with culminating creation. And it was very good. So now, let's put ourselves back in Joshua's presence as he's He's preparing to lead the people from the wilderness across the Jordan River into the promised land with all these battles coming up. He's just soaking in the, the fullness of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and he sees, he sees how it finishes. And we can just imagine hearing him just to himself saying, man, God gave us everything we could ever want. That's why it was very good. He gave us the, the, the beauty of creation and a river and mountains and beaches and sunsets and sunrises and, and palm trees and oranges and bananas and, and the glory of the animal kingdom and gold, precious stones. And I say with all sincerity, no sarcasm, he gave the man a woman who was naked and unashamed. And you hear Joshua say, he gave him everything he could ever want. All the authority, all the riches, and a beautiful woman. And then we just hear Joshua groans, ah, because he knows in that moment how much has been lost. Paradise has indeed been lost. He's been wandering around with people who are experiencing anything but the riches of Eden and the joy of the perfect relationships to be enjoyed. And I wonder if you groan with Joshua, just groaning, knowing how much we've lost deep down. Yes, I firmly believe we groan. We know that creation even groans. We groan because of what has been lost. So go ahead and let God, let God kind of place His hand wherever you're groaning. Wherever in some deep way, undeniable way, you know, man, I was made for something more. We were made for something more than this. And then we look again at the Word. I want you to imagine Joshua just trying to, kind of hunkering down in his study saying, man, why am I grieving like this? Why do I grieve? He starts to look back again at the text. Let's do that. Let's just point out some things in the text that shed light. So Joshua goes back to verse 4. He ponders Okay, the generations of the heavens and the earth. All right, the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and maybe it strikes him in a fresh way, the Lord God, the Lord God. All in chapter 1, God's name, Elohim. Now it's Lord God. It's 
Yahweh Elohim. Joshua ponders and all of a sudden he remembers the conversation he was told when Moses encountered a burning bush. Exodus chapter 3, God confronts Moses and he says, I want you to go to my people. Moses threw out a longer conversation says, well, what's your name? And God says in Exodus 3, 14, I am who I am, Yahweh. He says, you go tell them, I am has sent me to you. And when you tell them that, you tell them that I am sent me to rescue you. Joshua remembers that we learn God's name as I am when he's ready to rescue his people from those who are oppressing him. And he keeps reading. He comes to this section of the rivers. I don't know if you feel the same way I do, but it feels like a bit of an interruption, almost an intrusion. If you took verse 9 and took verse 15 and just squished them together, it would flow just fine overall. This this portion with these rivers just makes you scratch your head. What is this all about? And so Joshua maybe was scratching his head and he reads about the river that turned into four rivers, the Pishon and the Gihon, the Tigris. And then he gets to the Euphrates. It's the most well-known one. Even for us, we recognize that the most. But there's no elaboration on it, no description of it. But I want you to do this. I want you to turn with me. Chapter 15. I just want to point out one very neat detail. When God calls Abram, we'll get there in a few weeks. This is a sneak peek. Genesis 15, verse 18. On that day, the Lord, Yahweh, made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring, I give this land. This is the promised land. The promised land Joshua was called to take the people into. I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Joshua realizes he gave us everything we ever wanted. But he's doing it again. He's taking us back. He's bringing us back to paradise. The promised land is a return. God is taking us back to where we belong. He's taking us back to the paradise and the provision and the purpose and the protection that he created for us. That he created us for. And then he keeps pondering the text and he gets to verse 24, which seems like another odd interruption. You could take verse 23 and verse 25 and fit them together just fine, but verse 24, it's like Moses just felt inspired to to make a comment. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And maybe it's right here where Joshua realizes the the ultimate source of his groaning, the reason why he's groaning. If you think about all the ways that, that the marriage relationship is a foundation for God's people, it's a foundation for society, it is it is the ultimate building block of a community. He's watched generations fail to live up to that standard. Also realizing all along that when adultery is committed in a marriage relationship, that is ultimately pointing to an even greater adultery, idolatry. God refers to idolatry as spiritual adultery. We have to be reminded that marriages do not exist in and of themselves. They exist to reflect our relationship with God. Joshua groans, the people of God groan, we groan because we now innately pull away from our Creator. 
We pull away from the one who's been so loving to us, so gracious to us, so faithful to us. But there is hope. God could have given up on His people so long ago, but He's doing it again. He's bringing them back into the land of His promises. But we know, we know that even after they inhabited Canaan, the promised land, they still fell away from God. God planted Adam in Eden. We'll see next week. That doesn't last long. God plants Israel in Canaan. You can read through the Old Testament and see that doesn't go well at all either. They are unfaithful to their God. So would he do it again? Even after Joshua came and went and they invaded The promised land took over, demonstrated the power of God, were given a calling to shine the light of God to the nations, and they refused to do so. Would he do it again? Would God dare try again to bring his people to paradise? Yes. I want you just to listen to Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. God sent Adam to Eden. He sent Israel to Canaan. None of that worked. God sent Jesus to this world. And he gave up his life for his church, for his bride. Now he's calling us. He's he's empowering us. He is indwelling us to now take the glory in the name of God to the nations with a promise that there's a land he's prepared for us. Heaven. And just listen to some of the description of heaven. There are precious stones in heaven Things like gold. There's a river in heaven. The tree of life is in heaven. Fruit, abundant fruit, year-round fruit coming from the tree of life is in heaven. There's a groom in heaven. There's a bride in heaven. The question I want to ask for you is, will you be in heaven? I want you to close your eyes. Before I pray, I just want to speak to you who may be deeply groaning, grieving, because you realize how far away you've tried to run from your Creator and your Redeemer. I want you to know that God is in the business of bringing us back. As Jesus hung on the cross, there was a thief on his right and a thief on his left. And at one point, one of those thieves was broken over his sin and somehow sensed who he was hung next to. And he turned to Jesus and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked back at him. And what he said to him, I want you to hear. He said, truly today, you will be with me in paradise. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would whisper echoes of paradise throughout this room. I pray that you would call those who need to to repent of their sin. And for all of us, I pray that we would look forward to your promises fulfilled in your Son. It's in his name I pray. Amen. 
Would you stand as we respond to God's word this morning? adoration praise adoration now and forevermore be thine have a quick seat and receive your benediction from revelation 19 Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Amen.